Murphy, what do you remember about that? I remember that totally. You know, I remember Larkin Arnold telling me that um, uh, if I sang that and I can't sing a note, he said that would have been a hit. <laughs> and uh, um, I remember that um, Eddie had gotten most of um, a lot of the major stars to produce songs for him. Stevie and Ray Parker, and even had cameo. I don't know the whole list, but I, I do remember some of the old names. And, um, um, of course, uh, Rick and Eddie were extremely close. And Rick wanted to do, uh, you know, wanted to, to write something. So he wrote something very simple for him that he could handle. And, um, I mean, it became, it became a big hit. Um, hey, that was another song. If Rick had had it on his album... Instead of hitting those three million over there over with Eddie, Rick, you know, Rick, we'd have three more million on our side. But it's good. He didn't. He didn't think twice about that. You know. Were, were you guys surprised at all that it hit? I think it might got to number one. I'm not sure, but um, it was so ubiquitous on. I, I thought it was. And, it was it, I, I I really did not think that it was a hit. But you know, um, I want to say to Jay Lasker. Jay asked me about them. Um, about one of Stevie's new songs that was coming out. I, asked, I don't know if you remember, Jay was president of Motown. And he, he asked me, what did I think about this song before it was released? And I said, nah, what do you think? I said, because it's the people who, who think like you are going to make it a hit, not the ones who think like me. And it was that girl. Oh, mm -hmm. And it was a hit. A big hit. I said, you know, uh, you can't pick all the hits. You know, you, you, you uh, some people, um, uh, they can pick hits, uh, people similar to themselves. And uh, uh, Jay, um, older Jewish man who um, in the music business forever, who had that ear for like a massive crossover song. And, and you know... I could hear this being a good song, and every time I see it, I, I, I every time I hear that song, I, I, I think of this that that scene with Jay Lasker, and Jay um, uh, Jay was one hundred percent right. That song was going to be a big hit. You know, uh, it's a great song for me, but um, I couldn't tell you that it was going to be a hit. So so guys, like, like a Clive Davis is another one. You know. Oh yeah, Clive was great too. Clive could pick a hit. All he has to do is hear six beats, and he could tell you if it's going to be a hit or not. Incredible ears. Incredible. So what are a couple of stories you can tell from the road or are there any that you maybe haven't told before or you could tell a little differently um, that well, are just unforgettable? I, I, most of my, my stories are so X-rated that, that uh, uh, I might be imprisoned for <laughs> some of the stuff. <laughs> <laughs> Some of the stories, uh, but um, I don't know. It's just what what type of story you're interested in. I, uh, you know, I think quickly whether or not I want to well, tell you. Well, maybe uh, one story that relates to something um, more about the music, and maybe one story that relates more to uh, some of the uh, lascivious activities that that took place on the road. The music. Um... Let me see. There's a couple that I really, I mean, I'd rather put them in a book than to to, to, uh, than to say. Um, well, this could tease a book that that will come. Yeah. Um, <laughs> well, the, the the part that we talked about with uh, with Super Freak. I mean, I mean, I, I remember um, 
Rick really didn't want to put it on the on the album because he he said that it, it sounded too much like Devo. Mm -hmm. And I remember saying to him, I said, "Well, Devo's hot." He said, "Well, it's too it's too English techno." I said, "Man, but it's hot, you know." And that was the first time that Rick and I we um, that Rick Rick listened to me and said that okay, you know, because he was deciding he wanted to put another song on and take that off. Um, and didn't even want to submit it to Motown. I said, you gotta, you gotta submit that, you know. So after we had that little conversation, he put it on. He always remembered. He always say that, um, yeah, you must have a little bit of ear because you, <laughs> you picked that uh, super freak, and that super freak turned out to be a song. You know, you, I hear a lot of different stories about that, but that's the story that I remember um, talking to him about about. Um, and distinctly remember him saying it's too Devo, too, too English techno. And uh, uh, so that's one story. I, I particularly now, like I mentioned before, but the long version of that song, the 12 inch, had some great keyboard mm -hmm. synth, synth work. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, it was, it was uh, you know, a, a great song. And, uh, you know, I remember when he was just doing some very basic things with the. Dun, 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 dun. I mean, that's. Uh, um, if you listen to some of his early songs, like I think it's on, and I'd have to pull it out, uh, that same line, that same line is in one of his 1970 rock songs. Hmm. So, you know, you may think that it was, you know, he just uh, put a little funk on it, but it's that same line. And so when people say, yeah, I wrote that song, I said, oh, yeah, and I guess you wrote it in 1971, 72. How, how did he and you feel about it when uh, MC Hammer did what he did with it? That's another great story that nobody knows. See, Rick and I, um, uh, I asked Rick to, um, to sample his own music, to do what the rappers were doing. Sample your own roots music, and we'll, we'll, you know, we'll come out with a song and, and, and be able to compete with them, just doing that kind of same kind of vibe. And Rick said, "That's for the rappers. Let the rappers do it." I said, "Well, you know, then what I want to do is I want to get them to the rappers. You can do what you want. I want to get some of our songs to the rappers." So I got my um, my publicist. I said, "Look, I want you to go to the rappers out there and promote our stuff." And they took it to MC Hammer. So they took the whole catalog. And they, they, they picked out. I mean, you, you have to really promote it. You, get, you know, um, when all this stuff was going on, all the sampling stuff, um, I noticed that James Brown's music was getting a lot of play from sampling. And they said, well, we have to get in on that game. People have to start using our stuff. So our publicists, I had them go out and... Um, and go to producers and companies and look, I want you to do that. I want you to put these these things in music, in, uh, our music and movies. I want you to do this, that, and the other. You know, that's what I want you to do to focus on. And he went to MC, L, Cool J, and the rest and made it known that to uh, use some of Rick James music under the theory that a hit is a hit. Use it. Uh, so when Rick heard it, Rick was pissed off about it. How did he get permission? And I reminded him that... Um, you know, you gave me permission to do it, and we did it. And he's like, F that. You know, I didn't give it specifically. I said, but you gave permission to do it, and we did it. And that's it. It's done. By that time, it was already out that um, Rick was pissed off about the whole thing and uh, was going to sue. We never sued him or anything like that. And then when it, um, uh, when it started blowing up, it, it, it was to our advantage to keep it going like that because let people think that, okay, Rick is pissed off about this. When actually, they had to have a license to do it. Think about it. They had to have a license to do it. And they, they got a license from us to do it. So obviously we knew that they were doing it, uh, or I knew, and, and, and Rick just didn't know because Rick was like, uh, he didn't know about this whole sampling thing at the time because that thing was kind of, it was very new uh, in the business. 
and promoting sampling was very new. I don't still I still don't think that a lot of companies do it. I had a uh, conversation with one of the companies recently uh, about another artist, and I was like, well, you know, why aren't you promoting it? And he said, what do you mean promoting? Why don't you have somebody on it going to these people and saying, use this? I said, I can get you, I can get the, your artist, I can get his music with somebody, and I this is not my job. It's not my job to do this. It's your job. You're a publicist. Get out there and do it. Yeah, well, maybe I'll think about it. I was like, well, you know, I mean, that's the only way you get your music out there. Uh, it's either that or let uh, let one of these rappers go through the thousands of songs and then decide to use a song, you know. Well, and Hammer didn't just use it as a little snippet. I mean, it was the no. foundation of that song. Yeah, that was just, uh, that was the whole song. You know, and, and him dancing in that yellow clown suit. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> you know, it's like, uh, uh, well, did did Rick mind uh, the checks that I assume that came in related to that? No, but I reminded him that the whole the whole thought was that um, if we do these, if we do the sampling and that, then we're making a hundred percent. We're making album money. You're making publishing money. He's making three dollars. You're making seven cents per album. It makes no sense. Even though we might, might have made a half a million or more dollars on it, you know, what did MC make? Thirty million, fifty million. That was the thought in terms of getting him to do sample his own music, and that was something that people were doing. So you know, you got to stay, keep up with the, what's going on, and he um, he didn't pretty want to do it. So what was what's the story from the road where you had to really get? Um... You know, besides the, the the pot stuff, where you had to really get Rick out of like a sticky situation, or where things kind of seemed to really get out of hand. Or... I'm gonna, I'm going to tell you one story, the one about Dallas, that all of those people who weren't there, and who were there but weren't involved, did not really know what was going on, and that was um, Dallas was where uh. uh, uh Rick was supposed to have either jumped off stage or snuck around the police or whatever like that. And um, what actually happened was um, uh, this this uh, this baker had gotten taken by a drug dealer, and he had gotten taken for two hundred thousand dollars. So he was chasing us all around the the um, the country trying to get the money from us when the guy he gave the money from was not our promoter. And so, but he wanted to get it from us, and so actually we settled with. We gave him. He settled for fifty, and we gave it to him because this guy was never our promoter. So what happened was he chased us around every venue, and every venue he failed until we got to Dallas, and he had hired a lawyer, uh, Steve Casey, uh, who was John McEnroe's lawyer, and he. He was able to get a whole crew of policemen circle the stage, and they were going to arrest Rick. All right, and he's explaining all this to me, and I said, "This is unbelievable. Uh, you're not going to do this, and you're not going to get away with this. If you if you are going to do it, we're we're in a room, though, talking. I don't know that the police are already out there, circle at the stage circle, and Rick is already on stage. So um, he wanted the money then, or else he was going to take all our equipment." And I said, I'm not giving you anything. So when I walked out of the room with him, I saw that the stage was encircled by police officers. So I pulled this, the, the production people alongside and said, look, you got to get Rick off this stage. And when the show, when see Rick does an encore, so when Rick does the encore, bring him back into the curtain and we'll have somebody dressed as Rick who was his valet. Go back and finish the, the act. So he went out to finish the act. Rick put on a Rasta hat, walked out in front of the, the police and gave him the f finger right in his face. And they didn't know who he was. So he walked off and went off and he um, walked off the stage. Then California, when he came off, he had, a, he had a cape on. He snatched him and pulled the cape back. And who is this? And it's, Cal it's California's valet. And the guy said, well, you told me we could arrest Rick when he comes off stage. I said, Rick walked off stage in front of you guys and gave you the finger and you didn't arrest him. So they then they took all of our equipment 
um, uh, confiscated. But people were saying that California got beat up and all of this. That's not none of that stuff happened. They don't know they were the band was on stage playing. They didn't see what happened. And then the, the end thing is what happened was the drug the the banker. Um, he wouldn't release our equipment until we called. And I said, look, I said, I'm going to tell you what sucks and sucks. I'm going to get on the phone with your news people in Denver, Colorado, and I'm going to tell them that you gave $200,000 to a drug dealer along with Rick James. And how long do you think you're going to be a banker? So he sent us a private jet, released our equipment, and we went on about our business. Later on, we caught Steve Casey at the U.S. Open with John McEnroe, served him because there were some other little details that I'm going to leave out. Uh, and he ended up giving us our money back. So that's a little story for you. Wow. <laughs> well, you know. Was it like Rick, though? I mean, to sort of like poke the bear by doing the finger? I mean, and not being more low-key? Yeah, you couldn't You couldn't get him to, like, oh, you know, they could have arrested him. The whole thing would have been, like, the whole thing would have been a flop. But he walks down the stairs and gives to police, you know. <laughs> But those guys, they didn't even know who Rick, what Rick looked like. They was like, but they they knew that California wasn't Rick. Kelly was uh, his valet when he came up. Who is this? It's, that was pretty funny, though. Wow. There were so many stories. There was a story in every every venue that we played. There was another story. Uh, um, they tried to arrest us in so many uh, so many places. You know, in San Diego and Los Angeles, they sent stormtroopers in and. Process servers and you know, I mean, this guy chased us all over the country trying to get that money back. Um, finally, he gave up after Dallas. That was it. And that what, was it. what year was that? Hmm, probably eighty-three or eighty-four. Played the Dallas reunion. Um, I'd have to look at the schedule. I mean, that's in between. Like, I must have done a couple hundred shows. I don't remember what year, year it was. <laughs> you know, I, when, when, when did um, Rick's um, consumption and behavior start to go from being manageable and, uh, to where it seemed like it was kind of spiraling? I'd say from about 86, 87, on to 92, it was getting out of control. And did you try to talk to him? Of, what? of course, I tried to intervene. And then, um, you know, it, it, it was a struggle to fight against the drug dealers out there in addition to the drug users who were part of the van, Part of security, part of the crew, you know, it was a it was a fight, um, and af after a while, that fight became impossible. Uh, I mean, Rick was so far down the line that it is some of his security they were his suppliers, hmm. um, and it caused us to. Rick never missed a date, but uh, the things that weren't dates, he missed a lot of that. He just didn't care. You know, so, and he didn't want to do things. He didn't want to schedule things because he would prefer to use more than he, um, uh, than he preferred to work. Um, but that, that was a struggle. And eventually, uh, I left in like 90, 90, about 99, 91, something like that. Uh, I got tired of fighting drug dealers and drugs. I got tired of, I mean, um, I mean, it'll wear you out. I bet. How much do you think that substance abuse was directly related to his decline um, musically and commercially? Or do you think that... 100%. 100%. One, 100 I, can, I can go from the day that I suspected. I mean, it had an effect on, on his, um, his work his sensitivity to the people and what they wanted. You know, uh, after I thought everything after Street Songs was secondary to what he could do. Instead of rising from Street Songs, he slid 
from street songs. Mm -hmm. But I can see you can relate that directly to the first times that he's. I mean, Rick has been using drugs since the '60s, but not the heavy stuff. Uh, and when I say heavy, I mean bass and crack and that kind of stuff. You know, and one of his security was the one who who, who turned him on to it. Uh, but you know, I had to fight against guys who uh, uh, were always out there selling to the band and selling to uh, the crew, and um, uh, you, know, you had to fight against these guys all the time. And it just you know, after a while, it was like you know, it's an impossible fight. What did you do when you left? Well, I went to, uh, directly to practice law. First thing I did was open up a nightclub. And, and that lasted about six months, but it was uh, the most popular light nightclub, one of the most popular on the East Coast. But I saw that it wasn't what I wanted, and then I went right into um, practicing law. So obviously, Rick's use, wiped, you know, really diminished and eventually wiped out what he was doing. But also the music industry was changing a lot too at the late eighties into the early nineties. So did that also you think have an impact or is just purely Of course. I mean you, you know, uh, as I said, you know, you can have one hit, two hits, three hits. Rick had a long run. Seventy eight to eighty five, eighty six. It's a long run. Mm -hmm. In the business. It's a long run. But uh, uh, Rick should have been moving into strict strictly production strictly uh, artist development and those kinds of things. TV, um, uh, something else. But uh, uh, he didn't want to do that. He just uh, closed that room and did what he did. How come the Mary Jane girls only ended up with the two records? And Well, because uh, some people convinced them that they could do better with another company than they could with us. Um, and uh, the lead singer wanted to, uh, she wanted to get married, and, and, and her so-called uh, fiancé uh, convinced her to try to uh, sign with another group, and the question was whether you stay with us, because you only, had only done two albums, or you don't perform again for any other record company, and that's what happened. You know, yeah, you, uh, uh, it was a career choice. Uh, you had two platinum albums, and you had Motown on one side. We had to go to court about it. Motown is trying to get one of the girls to break away, and the, the girls are thinking that they can um, they can go and do something else when they're under contract. Well, guess what? It doesn't work like that, you know. Um, and no other company would would uh, touch them, not only because of, of fear of fighting with us, because we had a great legal team, but it was more that. Uh, you know, Mary Jane Girls was a Rick James creation, a Rick James sound. And without Rick, you had nothing. So if um, if you went to another company, which they did, they told them that, like you know, you got who's gonna who's gonna write for you? You don't have anybody to write for you. You, you don't have any value on that. And, and I told them before they left, I said, look, if you want to do something, wait till you have four or five albums, and then you'll have something, you'll have a name, and that kind of thing. You know, uh, but I think it was a poor business decision by people who had no knowledge of the entertainment business uh, uh, who were in, the, in their ear. And um, as a result, they never performed again. They never signed another record deal. And it's unfortunate because they were ahead of the Spice Girls and all that. They were, they were ready to explode, yeah. and, and but you know they just did not understand the business. They did not understand that you are under contract and you're the type of act that is self-contained through an artist, Rick James. Rick James is your sound. That's your sound in my house. Um, Candyman. Yeah, Candyman. Um, uh, the songs that they had, all of it, Rick James. You know, that, oh. that's your sound. It was. So it's unfortunate, but uh, 
uh, my feeling was that um, you know Rick was extending himself, and it really, he was really disappointed with the girls when they made that decision. It really hurt him bad, mm -hmm. and uh, because that was a creation that he had, and um, you know they didn't do anything until like maybe four or five years ago. Now now you got four or five Mary Jane girls groups running around there, you know. <laughs> Uh, like, uh, kind of like a nostalgic act now. Yeah, you got four or five different Mary Jane girls. Like now, you want to be a Mary Jane girl after fifty years. Good luck. <laughs> yeah. Uh, why do you think Process and uh, Val Young didn't maybe hit bigger than they did? Well, uh, a little bit of the same with Process. Process was also dependent on Rick, and. Um, you didn't have any writers there, and, and you tried to bring in some writers. And I think that uh, uh, CBS uh, had put in uh, uh, about two and a quarter million dollars into the, that group, mm -hmm. and they needed to sign an extension for six months, and they refused to sign it. Um, which any one of them would admit now that that was a big mistake. And, and I said, I will. I'm not going to give you another dime because this is a career decision. Either you want to be in here as a career. Or um, and all they want is an opportunity. Uh, they probably would have put another million dollars in. Um, uh, they had videos out that was on uh, on YouTube. Or, uh, the company loved them, but uh, you know they didn't. Uh, again, they were a group who really had never really had any music exposure on a big level, and then they walked away. You know. Val Young still, she does a lot still in her business. Um, she was with a lot of groups. She was with uh, the Funkadelics. Um, she's worked with a lot of different artists. Uh, uh, Rick gave her a break and did a couple albums on her, but you know, uh, I think one of her songs um, was a number one dance song, but it really didn't do a whole lot. As as I said, I think a lot of it was a lot of strain. On Rick, and if you weren't going to uh, be a good act, you know, then uh, go ahead and do what you got to do. Um, try to make it. And as you can see, afterward, none of them did anything. Yeah. Um, so when Rick ended up uh, going to prison, and uh, were you still in close contact? When Rick went to prison, no. No. No, I mean Rick and I had a, a falling out about legal counsel for the trial, and um, we had had tremendous success. That wasn't the first time we were sued. We hadn't lost. Let me say we hadn't lost the case in all those years. And Rick decided to take this one lawyer on. I said, No, I'm against it. He said, no, I want to take him. I said, Well, okay, um, you take him. I'm out. You know, I, I actually had been out, but I came back. But if, if you know, it's this guy, you're going to jail. If this guy represents you, you're going to jail, period. And that's what happened. Uh, so, you know, we talked when he got out. I didn't want to talk to him in jail, you know. Um, he got out, we talked. And, you know, got back together. But, um, you know, the jail is a hard thing, you know. What what do you think of the record he put out, Urban Rhapsody, when he got out? I I actually didn't. Ex I thought it was better. It was better than I expected. I mean, there was some strong mm -hmm. material on there. I thought it was good too. I just I think that he didn't have the record company promote it. Uh, I don't know which which company he was with. I really uh, since I wasn't in the business representing anymore, I didn't pay much attention to it. Uh, but there were some strong songs on there. Looks like it was maybe affiliated with Mercury. Yeah. Well, it didn't get a whole lot of promotion, and it was a different era, and it wasn't the uh, it wasn't the funk. It was more mature, uh, and I think it was probably ahead of ahead of the time. Most of it, although I think um, one track, "Turn It Up" or "Turn It Out," that was really. A good funk track, like old school, mm -hmm. you know. Mm -hmm. It was good to hear it again, you know. Yeah. Um, so, and then were you in touch, you know, did you ever get back with a close bond after that? Or 
Oh yeah, we talked. Uh, we talked a lot. You know, in fact, I was um, I was his main support for those last couple of years. Mm -hmm. So we were in, in touch, although he was in LA and I was in Buffalo. Um, we talked uh, indirectly for a while. We were talking through a, a mutual friend. And uh, he was always asking what I was doing, and I was asking what he was doing. And he's on the same phone. We're on the same phone. <laughs> he's on the line. I'm on the line. Um, and then we talked a lot, and I saw him a few times when I went out to L.A. Um, I didn't go out to L.A. much after um, uh, after I left the brick. I stayed on the East Coast. And actually, then I started spending a lot of time in South America and Europe. So I didn't spend a lot of time going Los Angeles at all. So I would only see him occasionally, but we talked a lot. I remember hearing that he wrote so many songs while he was, you know, in prison. Yeah. Um, but he still seemed to keep a relationship with, with Tina. I mean, he, you know, still did some collaborations with her, however they came off. Um, is there anything you can speak to in terms of, you know, that endearing relationship? I mean, it was tragic. She also, you know, died young, left us too too young. She did. Well, you know, I mean, there was a there was a close bond between the two of them, and at the same time that uh, uh, he was working with Tina, my sister was Tina's manager, so um, there was that bond was there, and she was actually there to support Rick the same way that he supported her when she was first coming out. So she went on that last tour, Rick went on that last tour with Tina. And Tina had gotten hurt um, and couldn't perform that last week or so. And Rick was going to be going back out um, about, I think, the, the week or so after, before he died. After, no, after he died, I'm sorry. Um, uh, he was preparing for that. Uh, but uh, yeah, they had a bond that uh, you know, no matter how much they fought or whatever, they you know, they still were going to be close, just like brother and sister. Hit me, y'all! Y'all better take some insurance out on your booty tonight, because we are not responsible. Ain't it fucking that?